Welcome back to Man Down Sports. As you can see from the thumbnail, we're talking about LeBron James again, man. Of course, his episode, his new episode, episode three dropped on Wednesday. You'll probably be seeing this on Thursday for the members. Uh, everyone else will probably see this a little bit later than uh, later than that. But members are getting access to this uh, earlier than everyone else, man. So I just want to uh, thank all the members. I appreciate y'all for being members uh, and uh, and you know, uh, subscribing to the channel and uh, watching the content, uh, donating to the channel and all that stuff, man. All of that stuff helps me continue to do it, man. Cause, uh, if I could, <laughs> if I couldn't get some type of donation, my wife would make me stop doing this. I mean, cause you know, I do spend a lot of time actually, uh, researching this stuff and, 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 and coming on here and talking to y'all and then editing and doing all that stuff, man. It is a lot of time, man. So I, I just want to say that to the members, man, I appreciate y'all a hundred percent man uh keep supporting me and then i'm gonna keep um pushing content out for y'all and then some of this members only content as well only y'all go see so yeah i, I want to go ahead and get into all of that stuff um this episode is not sponsored so i'm not gonna bore y'all with a sponsor ad um i just want to get right into everything right i just want to get right into it uh we're gonna talk about um Dwayne wade and the miami heat again with the big three uh LeBron James topic, like I said, Michael Jordan topic. And then I want to get into this Andrew Reese thing, man, because I think it's important to have that conversation. Wanna have that conversation very maturely, very carefully. Uh I don't want to offend nobody, but I do want to speak um openly and honest and transparent. And uh, you know, and and hopefully um, you know, people understand where I'm coming from with it, man. But I think it's an important conversation because it's been heating up as a late you know, uh, ever since that game. It was actually been heating up since last year's national championship. Um, so we're going to get into some of that, man. But let's get started with this first topic. So I'm watching old footage, and old clips, old podcasts and all that stuff. And um, I stumble across CP3's episode that he did on the Y podcast. It wasn't too long ago, maybe a month ago, with Dwayne Wade. You know, the Y is Dwayne Wade's. Uh, podcast and it's it's cool he's had Carmelo Anthony on there already CP3 he's had Pat Riley on there he's had uh, Tony Parker and Paul Gasol when they got inducted in the Hall of Fame um, so it's been a good conversation that he sits down to have I like the way he navigated the conversation it's pretty good and he gets to a lot of a lot of truths I like it right um, very different from LeBron's podcast but that's another topic right uh, but he said something that I thought was noteworthy, and I don't know if everybody heard it or um, or, or seen someone else create content around it, man. But um, he said something I didn't know about, which was that <laughs> the Miami Heat Big Three, not only did they have LeBron, Wade, and Bosh, but they tried to get Chris uh, Paul uh, the year after they joined. All right, so listen to them talking about it. But even though people have explained it, you talking about the but, Miami. But do you remember the call with Brian, you and I, when we were thinking about when Riley wanted to trade to bring you to Miami? Absolutely, you I remember, remember. We was, I was getting on the phone. I was sitting in my condo, and CJ was sitting. <laughs> <laughs> CJ, CJ was sitting on the couch. Right, if you go back to my brother, always there. CJ was sitting on the couch, and we was talking about me coming to Miami. Mm -hmm. We was talking about me coming to Miami. We was talking about. Who gonna have a ball in their hands? Mm -hmm. How it's gonna work? We having a conversation. Yep, we having a conversation, right? And then who was it? Was it CJ? Was it CJ that said something about who gonna wear number three? <laughs> Bro, that's what I wanted to get to. <laughs> we talk about all this about who gonna have a ball. Okay, we can all play together now. CP, I can play off the ball. We didn't yeah. figure all that out. And then somebody said, "Well, who gonna wear number three? Silence. <laughs> Listen, mess the whole trade. Listen, that's why the trade ain't happen. Mess the whole trade up because yeah, I, cause CP could wear number three in Miami. Mess Listen, the whole trade up. I don't know what they was gonna do because you was older. You probably could have just won. No, no, no. I wasn't older. You was, was older prime. than me. I was. I was in my. Prime. I know, but because you older than me, you just wear thirty three. No, no, no. See, and so this is the conversation we're having, and I'm like. That's my number. He's like, well, that's my number. Yeah, what we going to do? What we going to do? Six? <laughs> no, that ain't it. The that basketball it. number means that so much it. that. Yeah, so, they, had, so you saying, so we didn't get a chance to see this trade because of a number three? Man, that's listen, what I'm saying. Listen, wow. I'm saying the trade didn't go down. Rally didn't pull the trigger. 
Because CP <laughs> wasn't going to be our number three. Because he could have two. Could have two. Listen, 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 let me tell you. We had talked for a while, too. We had talked about what the team would Bro, look like. Bro, we started getting excited. We had talked about what the team would look like. All this different type of stuff. And then I think it was CJ yeah, that was sitting over there. He, we was like, he was like, what number, number are you going to wear? What number am I going to wear? What number he going to wear? <laughs> and that ended hey, the whole conversation. You know, how, you know how the football team, <laughs> like two guys be having a number? We just gonna have to do something. <laughs> we just gonna have to do something. That's why. I I mean, that's why I didn't go down. I remember when you when that question was posed. I was sitting there like, "Bro, what are you talking about? Like, just get another number." And CP like, "No, like I'm whole it's, trade." It's almost in Miami. Whole trade. Whole almost trade. because of whole, Jersey. A whole, a whole D Wade experience. D Wade want to sacrifice. I want going to D Wade. I want going to D D nine. D D want to sacrifice everything else. He ain't want to sacrifice damn number. I tell you, I, listen. I sacrifice not getting touches. <laughs> I sacrifice not getting the articles read and not getting the most money. But I am not giving up my number. <laughs> I am not switching my number, so it didn't happen. Uh, I just want to know if you remember that, bro, because it's funny that no one knows that conversation happened. But really, obviously, a lot of things had to happen for it to get right. But the fact that we had that conversation about the number and it would that's when that's we both, well, all of us was like, well, I was in my condo work. in New Orleans. I had like a couch or whatever. I was sitting on one side. CJ was sitting on the other. Everybody, they go to the story for y'all. <laughs> um, okay, so that's a that's a cool story, but just think about this for a second, right? Uh, and I got another clip to play for you, man, that goes right with it. But just think about this. You leave Cleveland, and I'm talking about LeBron James. You leave Cleveland. You've already got this thing worked out with uh, with Wade and, and Chris Bosh. Y'all fix y'all contracts where it's uh, capable of, of where, where, where you're able to all be in Miami together. And then you lose the finals. And then sometime after that, y'all start making phone calls to get another superstar in, which I don't even know how that would even happen because we know Wade wouldn't go be involved in trade. We know LeBron was going to be involved. So I'm thinking, was they going to trade Chris, Chris Bosch for uh, CP3? Or were they going to try to figure out a way to have all four of them? Which I don't I don't even know how that was possible. Like, they, they literally would have had those four guys and would have had to have the cheapest veterans on the vet minimum or some and some rookie contracts. They would, I mean, they really would have had to have that type of crew if they was gonna get three max players. Well, they took less than the max, I think. They took less than the max to make it work. Yeah, I mean, it's three of them. So I, don't, I just don't know how much money was left, right? So uh, maybe I'm, you know, they didn't really tell us if Chris Bosch would have been involved in that trade or not. Um, I don't think he would have been. I think they was really trying to work some ma- magic and um and have all four of them. But the reason why I even thought about that is because I was listening to LeBron James podcast. And he was talking about how the reason why they lost in Dallas the first year or lost against Dallas the first year is because they didn't have enough help. And I'm thinking in my head, how is three max superstars in their prime not enough help? Like, that's the whole purpose of a super team where, you know, cause it's, it's like options on how to build a, a, a good team, right? Either you're going to have one superstar and the example for that is someone like Jokic. You're going to have one superstar. You're going to have another all-star or all-star level player. All, all-star, like you can, you could be an all-star level player, but not make all-star because uh, the is, is only, 12 roster spots for each um uh, for each coast. And if you get locked up in a position like point guard that Jamal Murray is, it's a lot of years he wasn't able to make all-star because you gotta think they had Dame Little in the West, they had uh Steph Curry in the West. The last four or five years they've had Luka Doncic in the West, all in that point guard slot. Right? Then you gotta think about Darren Fox in the West, right? And, um, you know, that's how that was in the West for point guards. So it was very hard for Jamal Murray to make an all-star, but he's an all-star level player. So building your team, you get a superstar and an all-star level player. That's what Michael Jordan had. He's a superstar 
Pippen was an all-star, right? Some say he's a superstar. So let's just say he was a superstar. So I saved that example for uh, the next one. So the uh, example of one superstar and one all-star level player with role players that fit around them, which is great because guess what you get to do? You get to pay that one superstar. Jokic is going to get his money every single time. Jamal Murray, all-star level player. So he's not going to break the bank because he's never made all-star. So he's never going to be eligible for that super max. Right. So you can pay both of those dudes and you can even go down and pay Michael Porter Jr. Right. But he's never showed that he can be an all-star superstar, even though he's got that type of skill. But guess what? He's not going to demand that type of money. But but there is not a team full of number ones. Jamal Murray might have the capability of being a number one, but we know Jokic is a number one. Nobody else on Denver's team has showed us that they can be a number one somewhere. Right. Aaron Gordon was the best person on the Orlando team, but that's a difference from being a, a true number one. You know, you can be a number one de facto or a, a number one by default because it's just nobody there. Right. That's what Ricky David was in Charlotte. He was just the best guy there. That don't mean he was a true number one. But when he get around a, a real number one, he quickly goes to number two or number three. You get what I'm saying? So, um, uh, so yeah, that, that's number. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is you had two superstars, Kobe, Shaq, Stockton, Malone, Pip, and Jordan, right, with role players. Not very often you have three superstars in their prime on one squad, right? But when you do that, you're making you're, you're electing into being a top-heavy team, and you're not going to be able to spread around the money enough to get these all-star level players uh, to be your complimentary players or to be your uh, role players, right? So you're going you're gonna to be really finding true rookies. You know, that's why they bought in Norris Cole. Or that's why they drafted Mario Chalmers and he was thrown into the starting lineup, right? Um, you know, uh, you're going to get uh, veterans that um, have, have already earned all their money and made their money and maybe they're on their way out. They got one or two years left and they want to ride you for a championship. Yeah, you sign that guy for the vet minimum. Hey, I'm already got my money i don't need to try to break the bank so i come over here for cheap vet minimum so i can uh you know uh help y'all get a, a ring you know uh that's that's what pj brown did with the boston celtics sam cassell did with the boston celtics things of that nature right so that's how you feel your team if you're going to be top heavy like the boston celtics was they had a big three they had to ride with the young fella rondo because he's on a rookie contract and then you got to get sam cassell a vet minimum pj brown a vet minimum you know, Leon Powell, uh, Big Baby Glenn Davis, Young Boys, Ricky's on a rookie contract. You know, Tony Allen, that's Eddie House. That's how you build your bench. When you build your bench with guys like that, either old guys with one or two years left that's, that won't cheap money or rookie contract guys who's not proven yet that you, you're going to need to bring them along really fast or – some unsung hero type guy like Eddie House that, hey, you're a specialty guy. Or Tony Allen, you're a specialty. You're here for defense. Tony Allen couldn't shoot a lick. You're here for defense. Eddie House, you're here for just for shooting. He couldn't defend a lick. You get what I'm saying? Leon Powell, undersized power forward. Big Baby Glenn Davis, oversized, undersized uh, power forward and overweight. Like, these are the guys that's going to be on your bench and be your role players. You're not going to have the perfect role players. Listen to how LeBron explained this. Before we talk more spacing, I want to touch on one last thing with the heat. And that is, I feel like in the NBA, this, the, the, the phrase super team or the, the term super team is, is a little bit, bit of a misnomer. Because you can have, you can have a big three right? You still need four or five ancillary role players Absolutely. who star in their role and then complement the stars. No question about it. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work unless you have those guys. It and does. you've lived it multiple times. I've lived it. I've lived it. I mean, obviously my, my first year in Miami, yeah, we had a big three. And everyone said it's a super team, super team and super team that it was. But we had to build our team around all minimum guys. 
So which what? was still okay. Of course it was. But we didn't fill out the complimentary guys enough. Yeah, we had Rio, we had Udonis, you know, but we didn't we didn't have enough as far as enough complimentary guys to actually make it all work. And we still made it to the finals. We still made it to the finals and we still probably should have won the finals, but I still give credit to you. Listen, it is what it is. You, you win and you lose and we lost. There's no sure did. Dallas was fucking good. And they hit it. They hit a stride at the right time. Dirk was unbelievable. Um, but my second year, we was able to grab some complimentary players and role players that really just, I'm talking about super or superstars in there. Heck yeah, you grab some great players. And it goes back to my first year in Cleveland. My first year in Cleveland, yes, we got Kevin out of a trade. We lost in the finals. We wasn't really whole to unlock everything. We wasn't whole enough to unlock everything. Then we was able to add Channing Fry, add Richard Jefferson to that to that second team. Yeah. Add those guys. And then the experience that we had from the year previously. You know, JR got better and shunk, you know, and obviously we were healthier. You know, Kyrie goes down in the finals and, you know, busted kneecap and Kev obviously separated yeah, so shoulder right. in year one. But you're absolutely right. The complimentary guys are ultimately the ones that will help you win the championship for sure. Yeah. And so, classified as a, as, a, as a real super team. Right. So I think, I think you know, the goal of, of this show is to really just like talk about basketball. Sure, right. it is. It. And, it, and it's great. And I love it. I love it. I love it. And I could do it all day. I could yeah, do it all too. day. Me you know, I, we both live online. Let's be honest. We live online. <laughs> We're well aware of all the, the discourse. I, oh, I, I, I have to participate in the discourse. And, oh, and I said well, this. I, I, I want to participate so much <laughs> you know, more. I, uh, I, I, uh, I said this the other day. I was like, the discourse has a place, right? It provides yeah. a level of entertainment. Yeah. And I get it. And I, I feel like sometimes. I get annoyed at get annoyed. a couple keywords that get involved in discourse. And we're not going to do this every episode. Oh, we're, not we, gonna, we're not going to do this every episode. We're not going to do you this. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to save y'all the rest of the day. We're not going to do this every episode. The purpose of this podcast is to talk about basketball. Oh, I love it. I love it. You know, but we both pay attention online. And, uh, oh, I wish I could do it more often. Uh, that's the purpose of the podcast. They've been paying attention online too much. And they don't like the way the narrative have been shifting. They don't like the fact that people are saying X, Y, Z, whatever it is that they're seeing that they're all, oh, man, we ain't got control over this. Maybe it's time for us to go out there and go into this YouTube space and, 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 and be able to control that as well. Because we got big media, ESPN and all that stuff. We got the Stephen A. Smith, JJ Reddick is on there. They do that damage with their Nick Wright, Shannon Sharp. Right, but what what was going on online and on Twitter Spaces and 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 on YouTube and you know the things that's been shared on TikTok and 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 all of these platforms is a lot of opinions from regular people um, that don't work for ESPN. You know, so platforms like mine, right? Platforms like this one, we've been giving our opinions and they've been seeing it, and they don't like what everybody's been saying. So, hey, man, how can we further poison the 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 water? The ESPN thing ain't working as is is as well as we uh it was working before. So how can we poison the water again? Well, let's get our own podcast and let's push the push the narrative from that from that angle as well. We know we now we got it from the ESPN side and we got it from the social media side, and we can, you know, we can do it that way and push the narrative. That's what that's the purpose of the podcast. They supposed to be talking X's and all talking about basketball, but from from what I'm hearing, I keep hearing a lot of personal stuff uh, that's supposed to, you know, help LeBron James's uh, uh, reputation and image. All right. So now he's trying to talk about and clear up this big three thing and try to change everybody's d- definition of a super team. And now he, you know, he he wants to kind of uh, draw the point home that they didn't have a super team in Miami. That's why we lost. That's why we lost to Dallas. We didn't have no super team because our team wasn't we didn't have our bench right. It wasn't no super team until we get a super bench, right? So like I described earlier, if you have three max players, three superstar, number one franchise carrying players, perennial all-star type players, if you have three superstars, Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett, Ray Allen, even though they only had three years left on their prime, 
if you have three of those guys, you're not going to have a super bench. You can't have Paul Pierce, Ray Allen, and K- KG and then get a Reggie Mill on your bench. Right? Like I said, they had on their bench a old Sam Cassell with one or two years left. As a matter of fact, he only played one year with them. He was gone. Then they got Marbury the next year. Right? They had Sam Cassell. They had P.J. Brown last year. Right, that's that's a, that's seven men. That's seven. That, that's seven deep on the bench. Then they go eight deep with bringing on Tony Allen. That's eight. Then they go with Eddie House. These are guys that wasn't Eddie House didn't get drafted in no lottery. He didn't even go high as Mario Chalmers did. He wasn't gonna start on nobody's team. He never started. He came into a league, barely been a bench player. He was the equivalent to Damon Jones, which was on the Cavs with uh, with um, with LeBron James his first stint. He's a shooter. That was his specialty. He had a spe- that had a specialty player in that eight man rotation. Sam Cassell, Eddie House. Now the Sam Cassell was the point. Eddie House wasn't really a point guard. He came in at six foot, if that, playing off the ball like a two. So you know he was really a specialist. So they're going eight-man deep, Tony Allen, if they bring him in for defense, or sometimes he might play the small forward. They might play him, Sam Cassell, and Eddie House together. So that's three. P.J. Brown, that's four. So they can go nine-man deep. And then they had Leon Powell. Right? They probably had some other people. I'm going off memory. I'm just going off memory. So if you pull up the roster and, and, and I got I missed the name or whatever – I don't know if they had Big Baby Davis the first year. I think they got him. They drafted him the next year. The the, the year they won that championship, it was P.J. Brown, Sam Cassell, Tony Allen. Oh, James Posey. I forgot about James Posey. So, But listen to these names. The, the pieces fit. Now, if he would have said we didn't have the right pieces that fit what we were trying to do, I would understand it. But for you to say the, the words we didn't have enough, you had three superstars, all capable of taking over a game, all number one franchise carrying players who carried franchise, not capable of carrying. They did carry franchises. They were all stars on their own. They were the number one option. You get three of those together in their prime and not in the middle of their prime or the end of it. They was at the beginning of their prime. And you get three of those guys on the same team, and then you had the, the nerve to utter the words, we didn't have enough. Stop it. I, I could see it if, you, it was, if, if that was a mid-season trade. Okay, it's a mid-season trade. We just got one of these or two of these guys at, at deadline, and, you know, we were still trying, you know, we y'all, y'all had the whole summer. We had the decision. All of y'all signed, said not one, not two, not three. Seven rings, eight rings y'all supposed to get. And then Pat Riley was supposed to go to work with building the squad around y'all. And you go so you go utter the words that we got to the championship and uh, and just didn't have enough. Well, I'm looking at the team that you played in Dallas, and all they had was one superstar in their prime, which was Dirk. You had three Dirks. As a matter of fact, no. You had one Dirk, because I would say Chris Bosch and Dirk are almost even. So you had two guys above Dirk and Wade. And, and LeBron James, all right, well, you know what? Let me not say that. I think Dirk is above Bosh. So you got LeBron James. No, He has no equal up top. Wade and, and, and Dirk are on the same level. And then you got Bosh, who has no equal. There was nobody on that team that was equal to Bosh. Yes, you had J-Kid, but J-Kid wasn't at the end of his prime. He was past his prime. Jason Terry, nowhere near Chris Bosh. Sean Marion, nowhere near Chris Bosh. Tyson Chandler, nowhere near Chris Bosh. You got three of these dudes out of out of the top four players in the in, in in on the court. You had three of the best four players on the court. Make that make sense for you to say you didn't have enough. Then what the heck did Dirk have? You think Dirk had enough? So I'm I'm not with it. He said he didn't have enough, right? Um, Then he said the next year, they finally got what they needed. They got enough. 
The next year, I think they went and got Mike Miller. I think they went and got Shane Battier. They pretty much went and got people that started on their teams to come and fill that bench. Now, mind you, when I was giving you the example of Boston Celtics, they had real bench players on their bench. It's not one of those things like, hey, man, if if I wasn't on this team and I go to another squad, I could start. No, they had real bench players that supposed to be on the bench. Like that's like everyone. If you you go to every team in in, in the league, ninety percent of them you still on the bench. You gotta go to the worst three or four teams to be a starter on these teams. But any team in the playoffs, you're on the bench. That's that's the type of bench player they had. Real bench players. Miami, when LeBron said we didn't have enough, that means we need our bench to, to be starters too. So they go get Batty. Yeah, he started with Memphis, started with the Rockets. Come be on my bench. Mike Miller started with Memphis, started with whoever else he was with before that, uh, um, Orlando. Come be on my bench. Then after that, they went and got Ray Allen. Hey, come be on my bench. He started with a championship team. Come be on my bench. Went and got Rashard Lewis from Orlando. He started there. Come be on my bench. These are the type of dudes they're putting on their bench starters and then that's when he said we had enough oh we got enough now that we got a starting five on the bench and a a, a big three not just a big three but three superstars a super team we have a super team once we get a starting five on our bench that was a super duper team and not to mention they tried to get cp3 to join they tried to get cp3 just picture that so not only do you want to be top heavy, you want to be well rounded as well. Which I, every team should be well rounded, and every team should have pieces that fit. But it's very rare that you get to be top heavy and be ready. You're going to be lacking somewhere. If you're well rounded and you got, uh, you know, you got pieces that fit, and you and you and you uh, fill every hole. Uh, and, and you spread it like a Denver, like a Denver Nuggets, and you spread it. You know, you got a deep bench and all that stuff, and you, you know, you're you're going to be lacking something. And what Denver is lacking is a second superstar, unless you think Jamal Murray is a superstar. They only got one superstar in Denver, but if they do got two superstars, they they definitely ain't got three. So they lacking something. They only got that one uh, outside of Jokic. They only got one person that could, could they could make an All Star, and that's Jamal Murray. They're not loaded with all-stars, right? Miami had three superstars. That's three all-stars. They made all-stars the whole time they was together and before they got together. Then you then you add that with Rashard Lewis was an all-star. Ray Allen was an all-star. You add you adding it to your bench. That's crazy. You get that's five guys that is used to going to all-stars. Five. And then you try to add CP3. So yeah, that that was crazy, man. Um, I don't know what y'all think about that, man. Uh, I'm I'm interested to, to hear what y'all think in the comments, man. So y'all definitely uh, go ahead in the comments and let me know what you think, man. Um, a super duper team that I mean, they would have went past if they would have got CP3. That goes past super team. That's a super duper team. Uh, I can't believe they even tried that. And they and and they own podcast talking about it and telling us about it. I'm like, dude, what you like? <laughs> LeBron's legacy is not that set in stone where you can just come out and start telling that type of stuff. Like, you know, it's, a lot of people are, are, are going to start thinking like I think, you know, about LeBron. And to be honest with you, the more data I get, the more I start reevaluating uh, him as a player and um and, and start looking a little deeper at some stuff. And uh, somebody that was a lock in my top five, I'm now starting to put guys like Tim Duncan over, over him. Um, he, you know, he I had Bird and Magic over him about three years ago. I, I just recently passed him, passed Bird and Magic, but now after, after I'm reevaluating, I'm thinking about putting Tim Duncan, Bird, and Magic past LeBron. Um, and, and and that's me being real. So let's let's stay on the topic of LeBron James. So I was so after I finished listening to um, Dwayne Wade's podcast, I went to LeBron's and I was like, hey, let me get this. You know, because you know I did an episode about him 
uh, speaking about something uh, on this podcast a couple of days ago. So, uh, but that was just a snippet, and uh, uh, the episode dropped today. So, um, I was like, let me go ahead and get the episode a, a listen. And um, I couldn't believe my ears. I couldn't believe. Well, first of all, JJ Reddit asked him a question. And I don't know if LeBron didn't understand the question or not, but the answer he gave JJ Reddick, I don't even think really answered his question. But what he did say, um, I was just shaking my head. I said, oh my. after he done told everybody that he was flipping plays at eight years old, and that's something that people on his team can't even do right now. When he said that, I was like, wow, there's no way he can come back and say something like that. Like he throwing his teammates on the bus. There's no way he's going to say something like that every single episode. Please, because it's been episode one, two. I think the first episode he said, um, yeah, I think the first episode might have been him flipping the plays at eight. The second episode may have been. Can't remember what it was for a second, but here we are again. Let me just play for you what he said. Do you think for you there was anything transferable from what you learned in high school to what you had to do in the NBA, especially early on? From a coach's perspective? No, or from, just from on the player? court, on the court, being a, being a player on the court. No. Totally different game? Um, it was a totally different game, but the, the nuance and the, and the fundamentals and, you know, the things that was being – that was being taught to me as an 18 year old. I, I, I kind of had already knew a lot of that shit. I mean, it's, it's weird to kind of say, cause you feel like when you get to the NBA, you're going to learn so much more, which I eventually did, you know? And I think that just came with, like, we always talk about you experience. know experience. Yeah. The best teacher in life is experience, you know? But when I, when I got to the NBA, the biggest adjustment I had was literally just going from like, Oh shit, I don't have to go to class every day. You know, um, I, you know, I'm going from 27 game season to now 82. So like, oh shit, like after 27 games in the NBA, you know, around about 32 games, I'm like, I'm exhausted. You know, so now like what, what, what can I do to get the, get the energy back going? But as far as when I stepped out on the floor, there wasn't too much of an adjustment. Um, I felt like I was physical um, enough. I felt like I had the size, I had the speed, obviously. I had the athleticism, obviously. Um, you know, you have the, you know, some of the vet tricks and things of that nature, how to get away with certain things that I had to kind of learn and whatever the case may be. But, um, and then I was thrown around with many positions my rookie year too. Like at one point I was, I was a two guard at one point, you know, my first game in Sacramento, I was coming off floppies. Oh, we'll get to that in a bit. Yeah. You know? We'll get to that in a bit. <laughs> yeah. And we'll then next, you know, we know we, we do we make a change or whatever. Now I'm the point guard. It's like, you know, which is one natural position for me, but also not a natural position. Like I love to pass the ball. I love to bring the ball up, but I've never really started at the point guard position. So it's still very different, different, but, um, I was able to just, Kind of seamlessly, just seamlessly, kind of just move right on in. Just seamlessly. figure it out on the fly a little bit. Yeah, figure it out on the fly. Um, he said it was with the to tournament going on right now. Have the you? <laughs> he said I was able to come in the league as a rookie, coming fresh out of high school, and just seamlessly, just slide it. Wasn't no adjustment period. I ain't have to learn much. Yeah, the veteran tricks the other trade. Yeah, how I can get away with this foul or how I can do that. Yeah, I, you know, I had to learn that. But everything else, I was ready. I was physically wet, ready. I was uh, mentally ready. The only thing, I, the only thing that was different is that we played more games and my legs got tired. But other than that, man, I was just, I was just ready. At eighteen, who believes that? Seriously. And furthermore, have we ever heard anybody come out and just 
and say something like that. Any anybody. <laughs> Now, it, it's some people that I think was ready when they came in the league. Tim Duncan played three or four years at Wake Forest. I think he played all four, right? So he shows up a grown man with a grown man body with a lot of experience, a lot of head knowledge, you know what I mean? Polish like a mug, right? And when I say polish, I mean everything you need for your position, you equip with. Right. You know, some people come in at, like, you know, Tim Duncan played the power forward. You know, some people, power forwards come in. They don't have the weight yet. Kevin Garnett came out of high school. He ain't had a weight yet. So he had to guard Carl Malone and, and, and guys like that, man. It was probably tossing him around wherever. You know, Juwan Howard, they strong with they tossing him around. He admit that. Yeah, I had to get used to that. And you could visibly see it when, when, when he when you was watching him play. You could see. Uh, Kevin McHale, you know, uh, not using him as much his rookie season and until like midway through the season, and then he, you know he started getting it, you know, because I think Tom Gugliotta and uh, 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 some other vet might have been starting over Kev- Kevin Garnett at first, right? Jermaine O'Neal, he came in out of high school, very skinny. The Pacers didn't even put him in the game. He was on the weight program. Jonathan Bender. Was supposed to go to college. He went and showed out in the McDonald's All American game, and then was like, "Man, I'm going to the league, man. <laughs> Y'all making this look easy." He showed up. Uh, Pacers barely played him. His body wasn't ready, right? Um, so I've seen six foot eleven, six foot nine power forwards uh, not be ready for their position, you know, due to weight and all that stuff. But Tim Duncan had the weight and the size. Then he was polished as far as he wasn't raw, like. Um, Garnett was kind of raw. What he was good at was leaping ability, speed, dunking. But it ain't like you could go to the post to him and he just had an arsenal, right? The jump shot wasn't there. You get what I'm saying? Uh, so he was he was raw. As good as he was, he was raw. Um, players, rookies, for the most part, you want to come in raw, especially if you come out of high school. No matter how good you are, you're going to be a little raw. But if you do two, three, four years of college, like we seen uh, what Magic Bird, I think they at least did three. Jordan did three. Duncan did four. So you think about those guys coming in and you see that there was like Magic won a daggone ring his first season. Bird was competitive with Boston very fast. Duncan was very good his first season, and in the second year season, I think he run a ring. Carmelo came in, even though he was on, he only played a freshman year. You know he was polished, and he came in already with a, a, a NBA ready body and an NBA ready jump shot. You know, and he was very skilled and technically sound. So even Melo was uh what was NBA ready, still raw. But I say all this to say this. All of those guys I named that I thought came into the league ready, I've never heard them say, oh, it was a breeze. <laughs> Carmelo got a podcast. He made the playoffs his first year. Now, these guys are all in the lottery going to bad teams. Denver was a lottery team, not a good team, not a playoff team. Neither was Cleveland, neither was Miami, neither was Toronto. Bosh, Wade, LeBron, Melo all went to those teams, non-playoffs teams in the lottery. Melo and Wade both made playoffs that year. LeBron didn't. So if anybody was ready, it was Melo and Wade. This man telling us he seamlessly just fit into the NFL, NBA uh, uh, game and didn't have no setbacks. He didn't have to make no adjustments other than figure out how to play 82 games because we're not playing 27 no more. Come on, LeBron. Don't Come on. You got to stop saying this stuff, man. You really got to stop saying this stuff. Like, what what is what does that do? And J.J. Reddick didn't even ask you that, so I can't even say he set you up for that question. He asked you if anything you learned in high school translated to the NBA. Like, did, did you learn something in high school that you went to the NBA and was like, oh, I can use that? 
And he said no. And then he went down the path to tell him how ready he was. And he just seamlessly got into the NBA. He started it. He, he kind of started out by saying that, you know, everything that I was taught. Let me see. Do you think said. for you there was anything transferable from what you learned in high school to what you had to do in the NBA, especially early on? From a coach's perspective? No, or from just from on the, the court. On the court. Being a, being a player on the court. No. No. Totally different game. Totally different game. Um, it was a totally different game, but to- but the the nuance and the and the fundamentals, fundamentals and, and the you nuance. know the things that was being that was being taught to me as an eighteen year old, I I, I kind of had already knew a lot of that shit. Lord have mercy. So at eighteen is when he he joined the league, and he said whatever the NBA was teaching him at eighteen, he said the nuances. You know what nuances is. <laughs> Nuances is, is is the stuff that's below the surface, right? <laughs> He's saying the nuances that they was teaching him in the NBA, he already knew. Man, I can't, bro. I, I, I don't know the purpose of this thing no more, man. I, I really don't know the purpose of this podcast, man. This is amazing. I, I just can't believe he go give us something like this every episode. Every episode he go give us something like this. this podcast is to toot his horn. Him and him and JJ Reddick, man, yo, JJ Reddick is the worst type of dude, man. Golly, what is wrong with this dude, man? Sheesh. All right, that's it, man. That's all I want to talk about on that. That's it. All right, so Michael Jordan, uh, and and this and this this is a this is an interview on Club Shay Shay that Run Out Test did, and it's it's um uh, it's an OD but goodie. I like the way he explains some things, so I'm gonna play for you what Run Out Test said, and this is centered around Michael Jordan, and you know um, how he was when he guarded him when he was with the Wizards because that's, that's the Jordan that Run Out Test caught, the Wizards Jordan. And he talked about how how it was guarding him then, how it was guarding LeBron, and how it was guarding Kobe and KD. And he tried to compare those guys to MJ and then tried to kind of imagine if MJ was doing what he did to me in my prime when I was one of the best defenders in the league and MJ was doing that to me when he was 40. Um, He's trying to put his mind into what it would have been like to guard him when MJ was in his prime. So uh, this is, this is, this is our test. What made Jordan so special on the defensive end? Because I hear a lot of people say you look at him and he was a lot stronger than what he appeared to be. For sure. Jordan is strong. That's the difference. That's the difference between Jordan and Kobe, RIP Kobe. Jordan He's a, he, I, I, almost as strong as like myself and LeBron. Right. Not quite. Right. But right there. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I'm sure like the guys that played against him would say the same thing. Right. Yeah. If you were guarding Mike in his prime, how would you defend him? For one, honestly, I think let, let's just compare it to the greats I played against. Okay. In their prime. Okay. You put Kobe. So Kobe. T Mac. Yeah. LeBron. Yeah. You play KD. KD. KD was. All right, so when I caught KD in right. 2010, he was just becoming really good. Right. And you talk about Coach Scott was running all these plays, and I wasn't getting hit with no screens. Right. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm weaving and out. Right. And K, and all the plays for KD was run and get open. Right. You had, I think you had Ibaka. Right. But I'm getting around all that. Right. And I don't think he was ready for that. Right. So his percentage was way down. Right. And I was happy I had a chance to get rid of him early because there was no <laughs> way I was going to beat him. You know what I mean? So Four, five I, years later. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, but with LeBron, LeBron first game against me, he had 25. Right. And that was, that's when I was reigning defensive player. Yeah. Right. So I was like, wow, this is crazy. You know what I mean? But I did have some good games against LeBron. Right. So if I can compare it to LeBron or Kobe, Kobe might've gave me 40 once. You know, nobody ever scored 50 on me. I don't even think anybody ever scored 44. Only like maybe four times somebody right. got 40. Right. LeBron might've had 40. So if I compare that, I think Jordan – was a little bit better, maybe than those guys. Right. I think Jordan would have gave me fifty a couple times. Really? Sheesh. I, um, the reason, the reason I say that, because even in my prime, he had forty against us. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. 
when he was old. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he was old. Right. I was an amazing defender. Right. And Jordan had 40. Right. His prime. So my, I'm like, what the hell is going on? Right. So you hear a lot of people say, well, Mike would average 40. Mike would average 50. In today's game, with the rules the way they are, you played in both eras. How many points do you think Jordan would literally average per game? Today? Today. Shoo. More than James Harden. <laughs> James, James Harden had a CZ average 36. More than that. For sure. Really? For sure. And I, I was at the Jordan era. Yeah. I was in the LeBron, Kobe. Yeah. Duncan. And I was at the tail end. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I, 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 sit, I, I played with these guys. Right. I've seen all the three-point balls. Go right. Up. It can't. Jordan would. Jordan, no way. Jordan, Jordan would average 50. You believe Jordan would average 50? If he wanted to. Right. Like James Harden wants to average 50. He just can't. He right. Yeah, 38. Right. Amazing. Right. If Jordan wants to average 50, if he was playing his era, I think he averages 50. And this is no disrespect to any of the Jeez. guys. Current players. That's killing, like right. KD, you know. Yeah, all those guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not only that. guys, Steph and LeBron, LeBron and all those no guys. Yeah. Those guys yeah. 50, that's a lot of points. I mean, I think Wilt did it, but golly, to see Michael Jordan put in 50 without the three-point shot, he would have had to shoot more threes to get 50. Um, so I, I think the better statement would probably be that MJ could get 50 when he wanted it. And I think that's kind of what Artes is saying. He was like, if MJ wanted the average 50, if if averaging 50 was the goal, he probably would do it. But the way Michael Jordan talks when he does, when he when he finally does an interview with someone and that he's asked about scoring and stuff like that, he would always tell you it was far more important for him to win. You know, scoring is something he did because it was it was ingrained in him and, and it was something that, you know, that's how that's how he hunted, that's how he killed you by by dropping points on you. But if it wasn't necessary, I don't think he would do it. If if 25 is all I need to beat you, I think MJ would do 25. But if MJ needed 50 to beat you, he'll go get 50. Right? That's that that's that's how that's how he was. Like, you know, um, I don't know if he was like that before Phil. Um, but from observing how he played when it was in the structure offense in the triangle, and uh he understood what the assignment was you you could tell he you know he he scaled some of his game back to make sure the offense run but he knew the games that he had to say okay this is a 40 ball night oh this is a 50 uh night oh it's the knicks in the garden yeah yeah 50 tonight you know but if it's if it's the bullets you know on a thursday night yeah okay i mean as a matter of fact <laughs> uh the uh the bradford smith story um, when when he dropped twenty five on Mike and started talking trash, and Mike had a bad shooting night, and uh, he marked the next. Uh, I think they had a back to back, so they had a game uh, at their hometown, and then they flew back to Chicago. Had a game there. And they said Mike just he was locked in on him on, on getting his revenge, and he went out there and put almost fifty on him, and embarrassed him, and made sure that hey, look, man, what happened the other night. That ain't happening again, you know. Uh, you know, what I'm saying I can I can do this to you anytime I want to, right? So uh, that's one thing I liked about MJ. But to hear, to hear Ron Artest say that he's uh, beyond Kobe, beyond LeBron, beyond Durant, beyond James Harden, and he guarded and played with and against all of those guys. Uh, well, he played with Kobe, he but he played against all of them, right? And, and for a defender like Ron Artest to say, yeah, I, I guarded all of them and I guarded Jordan when he was 40. And it ain't no it ain't no comparison, you know. Um, and later on in that interview, he asked him, what you what do you think Kobe would average? And he, he said probably 40. But he's saying Mike could get 50 if he wants to. That's insane. Just think about that. Right. Just really think about that, man. So um, a lot of people don't get how. How how real it is with Michael Jordan with his scoring. If you if you didn't witness it, if you didn't grow up in that area, you didn't watch it, and you didn't see the opposition as far as how defense was played in that era, um, uh, and you know, and how you had to score against it, and how the lane was clogged. Like I was listening to LeBron podcast with JJ Reddick, and he's talking about 
before they started running the spread offense when he was in Cleveland and they wasn't running the spread offense and Big Z was in the post and whoever, you know, his other big man, I don't know if it was Boozer or Drew Gooden or uh, Jamison or whoever it was, you know, Varajal, maybe, I don't know who it was, but he was saying uh, they would be in the paint. And um, I think in a series that they got put out by Orlando and Dwight and Turkaloo sent them to the crib, J.J. Reddick was on that team. And J.J. was telling him, you know, because I think LeBron averaged 38 eight and eight that series. But th- th- this is the thing about LeBron and his his averages when he get put out. Like, you know, people talk about what he averaged against the Spurs when he got forewarned. Or what he averaged against the Warriors when he got swept. And Iguodala got the MVP for guarding him. And Kawhi got the MVP for guarding him. And everybody was like, why they giving the defenders the MVP when he dropped 35 on them every game. And then you got to you gotta really use your brain and say, why voters voting for them if LeBron averaged so much and their job was to defend uh, LeBron? Well, the reason why we foreold you or forewarned you, but the reason why we swept you or gentlemen swept you is because the game plan was for me, Kawhi Leonard, or me, Iguodala, to guard you one-on-one and don't double off your uh, your shooters. That way you have to beat us by yourself. And what's going to happen when you guard somebody one-on-one as good as his, uh, LeBron is, he's going to get his numbers. But would you rather hold LeBron to 25 while his shooters get 15 here, 18 there, 12 there off threes, and y'all go seven games? Or would you rather go ahead and beat him in four games or five games and he averaged 35, and his shooters averaged 8, 9, 11, right? So that that's why Kawhi and Iguodala got those MVPs, because they was guarding this man one-on-one as great as you can guard someone that good one-on-one without doubling, right? So he got his numbers, but guess what? We winning. We sweeping you. And... The Orlando Magic beat him, but he got his numbers. And him and LeBron and uh, J.J. Reddick was bragging about the 38-8-8, eight and, eight, and he said, we was doing that without the spread offense. And J.J. was like, oh, that's amazing. I think about that. How did you average 38-8-8 eight, eight, and eight without the spread offense? Like, So now they're trying to dispel the, the, the narrative and the rumors that he need the, the floor spaced, right? but they're doing it out of context because they're, they're just going to the numbers. Who cares that he averaged 38, eight and eight. Why did Orlando led by Dwight Howard send him home with a 66 win team that season? How you win 66 games, get MVP, be unstoppable all year and can't get past Dwight. Dwight sent you home. Who better LeBron or Dwight? So yeah, you got your numbers, but, we beat you. We foretold you. You couldn't even force a game seven. And we would have forewarned you if you wouldn't hit that uh, that uh, desperation shot on the buzzer. I think you you won game two, maybe game three. You might have been down 2-0 and, and you hit the buzzer be the, uh, the, uh, to the make it 2-1 in game three. Good game. Good game, winner. Very lucky. Right? So... Um, they're trying to brag about the 38 he averaged <laughs> and just not go mention the fact that you only got two games and, and, and this is a 66 win ball game, a uh, ball, uh, ball team that was supposed to get all the way to the finals. And it was supposed to be a LeBron versus Kobe finals, but instead it was a LeBron versus uh, or Kobe versus Dwight Howard and Dwight Howard swept that team, the team that beat LeBron's team four two. Kobe swept them. Or for one, I'm genuinely sweet. Sent them home quick. Sent them home. But they want to talk about 38 points, eight rebounds without a spread offense. Oh, you did that without a spread offense. They try to sneak that in there. Oh, you did that without a spread offense. No, I don't try to sneak that in there. We know he need that spread offense. You, you need what's going to work and help you win, not what's going to help you get your stats. 
We already got the book on LeBron. If we lose, it ain't going to be because of me. I'm getting my numbers. So, yeah, no one's bragging about you getting your numbers, man. All right, man, last topic, man, and this one, this one, this one should be a good one. And this one, we got to approach it very maturely, right? And uh, this, this is the thing about, about me. I'm an open book. I'm transparent. But I like to be able to speak my mind. And I think if you have friends, uh, and all of your friends and all of your family not going to think like you and um, y'all not going to have the same upbringing most times, especially your friends. And you meet them along the way. But the, the way you, the, when you become a friend of somebody, the, the way to be a really good friend is you got to be able to be honest. I can be honest and respectful. Like you can't, you can't be honest and then disrespect me in your honesty. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? If you want to tell me my baby's ugly, that's fine. Be honest, but be respectful on how you tell me the baby is ugly. You, you get what I'm saying? Like I want the honesty, but be respectful. Right. So, and that's what we got to do when we're dealing with differences. When, we, when we're dealing with gender differences, age differences, uh, upbringing differences, race differences, Right. When you when you got all these differences amongst friends, associates and all that stuff, you got to be honest. Right. So I should be able to say the baby's ugly. And now I'm not talking about a, a, a really a real baby. I'm talking about the situation being the baby. If the baby is ugly, I should be able to tell my friend, my associate, my co-working, any my business partner, anybody I got a, a relationship with. I should be able to come to you and tell you the baby's ugly. Right. And I shouldn't have to beat around the bush when I tell you that. You know, I shouldn't have to say, oh, the shoes are cute. I like them Jordans. Nah, I'm going to tell you the baby's ugly, right? Whatever the case may be, right? I say all that to say this. In a situation like this with Angel Reese and the media, and I'm not even going to say Caitlin Clark because Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese don't have an issue with each other. They competed. They don't have to be the best of friends. They respect one another as uh, as as athletes and, and peers. Um, they've said multiple times, "There's no ill will. I have no hate for that girl. She's an amazing player." They both say that. I love the fact that they hugged at the end of the game. All this stuff, I love it. They competed, right? Um, but the media turned it into so much more. The fans turned it into so much more, right? Um, so to understand. All of that, we kind of got to go back to last year, right? Um, I'm going to play you what uh, uh, Emmanuel Acho said that I think was kind of ignorant. I'll play you what he said. And a lot of people is, is liking this sound bite and sharing it because there's a lot of people that think like him. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to play what he said. And then we're going to go back to get some understanding on this thing. But what I said at the beginning is, is, is the real deal, man. We're going to have a real conversation. Right. And if there's someone that's a non black that watches this, um, I'm not trying to offend nobody or nothing like that. You know, let me and, and let me know. Call the baby ugly if it's ugly. Go in the comment section. You can, you know, uh, whatever, whatever the case may be. If I'm off with this, let me know. Keep me honest. Right. But here we go. About to give a gender neutral, racially indifferent take. Now, if you want to say, well, Acho, cater your take based upon gender. Acho, cater your take based upon race. I will understand that. But I'm about to give a gender neutral, racially indifferent take. Angel Reese, you can't be the big, big bad wolf, but mm. then kind of cry like Courage the Cowardly Dog. Mm. Because if you want to act grown, which she has, if you want to get paid like you grown, which you are, if you want to talk to grown folks like you grown, which you did post game when you told a coach for an opposing team watch your mouth if you want to tell people get your money up then post game when you take an l you just got to take it on the chin nobody mourns when the villain catches an l and angel reese you have self-proclaimed to be the villain shout out to you because you were the second best basketball player on the court and it was not close outside of caitlin clark it was you 17 and 20, dog, showed up, biggest game, second biggest game of your career, absolute dog, but you can't under any circumstance go to the podium and now try to ask for individuals to give you sympathy. No one has sympathy for the villain. Mm -hmm. You painted the bullseye on your back. Why are you surprised when people shoot at you?
So if you want to act grown, if you want to pose grown, if you want to talk grown, if you want to talk to grown folks grown, then you got to take the L like you grown. Because what frustrated me is when you want to be the villain, but you want to hope for sympathy like a hero. On the same. All right. So he said villain a lot. Right. That's a that's a word we go. We go pay attention to. He said villain a lot. He said a lot of things. He said can't a lot. You can't do this. On one hand, you can't you can't do this. And then on the other hand, do this. Can't can't can't. I keep hearing this word. You can't do this. You can't do this. You can't cry. You can't do this. So that, that they're setting a, a precedent because you did this. That means you can't do this. You're the villain. You want sympathy. You was the big bad wolf. You made yourself the villain. You painted a target on your back. You know, all of this stuff, man. You know, yada, yada, yada. We've we have we have we have heard all this. So let's break it down, right? But let's go to the beginning first. So, how did all this start and how we understand this? Well, if you remember last year, Angel Reese, LSU, uh, had a, a good season. They had a good year. Angel Reese was getting a lot of notoriety. She was getting a lot of attention. Um, the first time I seen her last year, I remember her playing defense uh, and defending a play. And then her shoe came off. And then, uh, you know, somebody drove the lane. And while her shoe was in her hand, she picked her shoe up. And when the ball came back toward her, she blocked the shot out of bounds with her shoe off and in her hand. And then she got kind of excited. She got fired. You know, you know how when you make a play, you, you know, you flex. I, I can't remember exactly what she did. But she, so when I was like, man, who's this girl right here playing defense like that? I like that. Like, you know, I like anybody that play basketball that really takes pride on the defensive end. So when I seen that and I was like, oh, man, this is a young lady that's taking pride in defense. I like that. Right. So that's the first time I seen her. First time I seen Caitlin was the year before last. Uh, where she went off on a, a, a game where she knocked down a lot of threes, you know what I mean? So, uh, I, I kind of knew about both of those girls, but I knew about Caitlin first, right? So, they pop on the scene last year, they both having a good season, and there's nothing really bad going on. I see that Caitlin is having really good games, and Caitlin is fired up, she's a fiery type female right um and and we like that she she she's a crowd pleaser um she she taunts her opponents she screams at the crowd she yells she pumps her chest you know she does all of that type of stuff right and there's nothing wrong with that we like that right so that's that's Caitlin that's what that's what she does right um now in the tournament Caitlin uh, is is playing really well, and they're playing a really good South Carolina team, and they have a girl on there that can't really shoot. And I never forget where every time the girl got the ball at the top of the key, Caitlin would not guard her. And a couple of times she looked at her when she got the ball, and if you can see right here, she's waving her hand at her like, ah, oh, she's self-checked. I don't even have to get out there. And we just thought that was just – um, it was the funniest. Oh my God. It, we thought it was the cutest thing in the world to catch me out. You know, oh man, just wave her off. I ain't got to guard her. This is stuff she's doing in the middle of the game to her opponent, right? No one had any issues with it, right? Right. Then she did the John Cena, you can't see me. She did that against a team or opponent in the tournament. And I never forget in the championship game in the national uh, title, LSU versus Iowa. When LSU won, Angel Reese did it back to her. And when they asked her about it after the fact, I think she mentioned that she didn't like it when she seen her do it to her opponent the game before or, or two games before. So she made sure when I beat you, I'm going to do it back. So it's taunting, right? Angel Reese taunts. Uh, Caitlin uh, Clark taunts. Angel Reese gets fired up. Clayton uh, Caitlin Clark gets fired up during the game. Caitlin Clark also taunts her opponent. 
You can't shoot. You're a self check. I'm not going out there. This is normal stuff. No one had an issue with it. The only issue happened when Angel Reese did the John Cena to Caitlin Clark. So this is where the issue starts. Before that, there was no issue. In, nothing that Angel Reese did bothered the media so much to where they started talking about her in a negative way. Nothing. Nothing that Caitlin Clark did bothered the media so much where they started talking about her in a negative way. Nothing. So the issue started at the national championship game when LSU had decided the game and won and Angel Reese gave her the John Cena right back at her and pointed to her finger saying, put a ring on it, right? Put a ring on it. And that's when the issue started. That's when everyone started talking about how classless she was, um, how uh, of a piece of shit, how much of a piece of shit she was. And all of these things, right? This, this, this is coming from professionals. They're tweeting this out on their platforms, right? This is uh, the owner of Barstool Sports, Dave Portnoy. He didn't like the fact he retweeted Sports Centers, put a ring on it with uh, with Angel Reese, called her a classless piece of shit. Look at the bottom and you see seventy nine point four million views. On that tweet, seventy nine point four million. I remember the night when he tweeted this, and I read under some of those comments, and they were bad. But the reason why I won't show those comments because those comments was mostly from regular fans who don't have blue checks, who don't have huge platforms like Barstool Sports, who wasn't professionally trained by ESPN like Dave Oberon. Right. So I, I, I'm just going to talk about the blue checks. This is someone who knows he got a reach, who knows he has a huge platform and a huge voice and knows that when he tweets this out, a lot of people that think like him is going to see it and that's going to set the tone. So this is Dave Portnoy, not no regular dude, classless piece of shit. Right. Why is it classless? Why is that classless? And this not classless. Why is this not classless? Right? Explain to me why it's not classless. If if one is classless, then the other one is. If one is not classless, then the other one is not classless. So, I mean, you got to call it fair across the board. So when you start seeing the same type of things go on with different players, they're doing the same type of things. They're both taunting. They're both playing with fire. They're both uh, uh, throwing hand gestures up. In most cases, the same hand gesture. When when both of the, uh, of the athletes are doing that, what is the only thing that's different that'll make someone say, well, this one is okay, but this other one is not okay? You got to ask yourself that, right? You got to ask yourself why a professional – they used to work at ESPN like Keith Oberman, who still has a huge platform. If you look down at the bottom, that's 35 million, 35.1 million views on this tweet. He retweeted the same sports in the post. What a fucking idiot. So now I'm a, I'm a piece of shit and I'm a fucking idiot. And this is within an hour of the championship game. This is this is this probably before she even got back out of the shower. All right, she's a she's a classless piece of shit and a fucking idiot from two professionals, right? But it don't stop there. Right? So it doesn't stop there because what happens when you get to the national championship and win, it is customary and traditional for the White House to invite the winning team for a visit. That's supposed to happen. NBA, NFL, college. They invited. So not only is people with big platforms like keep Overman pissed off and calling her idiots, effing idiots, so unprofessional. They're not trying to be professional. They're trying to be uh, offensive. Dave Portnoy, piece of shit, POS, right? 
This is what they're saying. And these are high profile people. How high can it go? How mad are you? Who's all mad? Why are these people this mad to what they're saying? Offensive thing, offensive language because of a hand gesture. But it wasn't offensive when someone on the other side did it. Why are they mad? Why are they triggered? What pricked their heart? You have to ask those questions. What trick? What triggered you? What got you in your emotions and your feelings? It's a basketball game. Why were you emotionally invested enough to where the letdown of them losing and then getting it rubbed in their face that they lost angered you so much and triggered you so much? You have to ask yourself that. I think I know the answer, but people have to ask themselves that question. Why did I get so triggered? What am I mad about? You got to look yourself in the mirror. What am I mad about? And why wasn't I mad when Caitlin Clark was doing the same thing? Why not? Right. You you have to ask those questions. Right. But how high does it go? Can it go all the way to the White House? Well, here's the first lady. So I know we'll have the champions come to um, to the White House. We always do. So, you know, we'll have LSU come. But you know what? I'm going to tell Joe, I think Iowa should come, too, because they played such a good game. So, right. So winners and losers, that's sportsmanship. That's good sportsmanship. So it caught the attention of the first lady of the United States of America. And she goes out and said, you know what? We usually invite the winners. But this year, I want to do something different. Let's invite Iowa, too, because they played a good game. I want you to sit down and just let that sink in. We want to invite Iowa because they played a good game. Why do you think that the first lady seeing the losing team and 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 got involved where to where I'm going to invite them to the White House with the winners. They don't even feel like they don't even give the winners a feeling like they actually won. They might have been looking forward to that White House visit. Now it don't mean nothing to them because, hey man, we didn't even have to win to get an invite. And if we would have lost, we, we got an invite. Do you think if LSU lost, they was going to invite them as well? And she said that they played such a good game, they got beat by double digits. It was a blowout. It was like 102.85. Right? They got they got beat pretty good. So that good game that she's talking about, I don't even know. I, I don't know what she's talking about. Right? So you got to ask yourself, do you think she invited them because they really played a good game? Or do you think that just like Oberman and just like Portnoy, that when she, they seen Angel Reese taunting Caitlin Clark, that her heart got pricked. Do you think that the first lady felt emotionally connected to Caitlin Clark? And the answer is probably yes. And for Dave Portnoy and for Oberman, the answer is probably yes. So this is what I think happened. What I think happened is just like all humans do, they connect with people that they can relate to. So if I see someone in the NBA right now that's from my hometown, I'm probably going to feel connected to them. I got a good friend, a good uh, 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 army friend that we used to talk about Michael Jordan and uh, LeBron James all the time. And he would always tell me LeBron is this, LeBron is that. And he's from Ohio. And we would get in deep arguments about LeBron and Michael Jordan. And one day he was honest with me. was like, I'm going to just be honest. When he said, I'm, a, I'm just a kid from Akron. When he won that championship in Cleveland and he had tears in his eyes. My friend told me he had tears in his eyes as well because he felt it. And he said he's emotionally attached to LeBron James. So he can't even see clearly because of the connection he got with LeBron just by them being close proximity and being from around the same area. So when you're someone in a, uh, a, a high-profile position, it's hard to cut that human element. You need training. I've been trained in it. It's hard to cut that human element off to where you're connecting to things where you're easily being biased. So the first lady looked at a young white lady in America 
and was able to see herself in her easier, easier than she could see herself in uh, Angel Reese. Dave Portnoy, another white American. Keith Oberman, another white American. When they see this, uh, and, and it's not often we get to see a young white American in the sport of basketball, male or female, come in and dominate like this great athlete, uh, uh, Caitlin Clark can. So when you get one, you kind of get connected to them. Though you know, uh, my my white friends that get connected to it, which is fine, because if 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 it was a a, a white dominated sport like maybe hockey. And we had one black guy in there. I think uh, even with NASCAR, even with oh, with tennis and with uh, uh, golf, people get connected to Tiger just because he's black, right? So it's 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 easy to do that if if you're human, if you allow it to happen. But what you can't allow, it's fine to have a connection with them. But what you can't allow to happen is that connection to make you start to be biased. And then make you start to be overly emotional because that connection, what happened is when they seen Angel Reese taunting her and it hurt her feelings and they got to see her in defeat, be taunted or taunted by Angel Reese, an arrogant, bigger, hood, black girl. Oh, no, we can't allow this to happen. And that's why the backlash was so nasty. That's hate. What Angel Reese is doing is 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 at the worst poor sportsmanship, at the worst. But at the least, it's just a regular taunt, just like anybody else would do when they're in competition, right? Just a regular taunt. So let's move it on to this year. Now. Angel Reese get a rematch against Iowa. Iowa wins. Caitlin Clark plays very well. Angel Reese play okay. Angel Reese cries at the podium. And that's when we get this sound bite. Ocho saying, you can't cry. Because you did this. <laughs> Let me see if I can find this. Because you did this. You can't cry. Because you did John Cena, you can't see me. You can't cry. Because when everyone start calling you pieces of shit, when everybody start calling you fucking idiots, and you had to put on that hard exterior shell to keep yourself from breaking down, because for a young 20-year-old, I mean, this is coming from grown 50-year-old men that's supposed to be professional and supposed to be elders and supposed to be showing us, uh, uh, you know, how to be professional. You're coming out of your box or your professional box and you're doing stuff like this where you can't take it back. That's, That's in the cyber world forever. Right? You coming at a 20 year old like this. All because she was talking to another 22 year old about put a ring on it we won i'm taunting you i'm rubbing it in right so the 50 year old got so mad that he had to come to her protection in this type of way right so ocho or whatever emmanuel acho is saying because you did this you cannot then cry a year later you did this last year so you can't cry i don't care what everyone said about you to you in the media or whatever, it was warranted because he's saying because you made yourself the villain, you have to accept all the bad stuff that comes your way. We have to allow grown men to say these things about you. We have to you have to accept the fact that Jill Biden wanted to invite Iowa to the White House and didn't care if it offended LSU. You have to accept all this. Right. And furthermore, even before the game, because before we get to her going to the podium and crying, before we get there, we got the L.A. Times article that had to be edited. This man tried to pick. (laughs) I know what's going on. 
and, and we have to be careful not to let our emotions get to us, right? Because this is the same trick they use with Magic Johnson and Bird. It works really well, especially in America. You got a non-black, most of the times it's going to be a white man, white woman, who represents the good the goodness of America. Why? Because maybe uh it's something that they do that identifies with what the 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 foundation of America is, like Larry Bird, blue collar, hard working, no nonsense, you know, um, all of that type of stuff. Magic Johnson was the opposite. He was Hollywood. He was a big smiler. He wore fur coats. You know, uh, he was flashy. You know, he had a flashy basketball game. You know, uh, his game was about style and 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 all that stuff. And Bird was about hard work. So to put <laughs> Michigan State and Indiana State against each other, oh man, they made so much money in the NCAA. And then they did the same exact thing. They sent one to Boston. That I mean, Boston is the epitome of Larry Bird. Larry Bird fits that city so well, and Magic fits LA so well. What a what a home run for the NBA. And they pitted pitted them again against each other again. You got America versus the black villain. Somebody representing America versus the black villain. It always works. Where else we seen it work at? Well, we seen it work again with Caitlin Clark representing America and the villain. Remember that word, the villain of Angel Reese, the villain, the bad villain, right? We seen it work with Blue Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. We seen it work with the NFL and Colin Kaepernick. Right, that 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 villain. It always works. Can we spin this to make some money? The NCAA was counting on this on this rematch, right? I think it broke a record, like twelve point nine million. Watch that game. Huge, huge ratings. They made a lot of money off this game, right? But you got to ask yourself, how does a writer write this? And this is not even the whole article. You just. Uh, it's just a little uh, excerpt of it, right? How does a writer write this and it get past the editor and gets published if the editor didn't want it to be published? It was almost like, hey, let's throw some fuel in the fire to ignite it a little bit more because we're going to have so many people watching this game because you're going to have people watching this super mega star in Caitlin Clark. We, we can't wait to see her perform, but guess what? We also can't wait to see her get her revenge against LSU and send Angel Reese home packing and beat her and shut her up, right? That's why we watching, right? So, hey, they they put an article out like this. This isn't just a basketball game. It's a reckoning. Picking sides goes well beyond school allegiance. Do you prefer America's sweethearts? And this is the article that came out right before LSU played UCLA. Do you prefer the America's sweethearts, which was UCLA? This is oh, they represent America, or the or, or it's dirties, uh, debutantes, milk and cookies, or Louisiana hot sauce. You got to be kidding me! And this is the stuff that Emmanuel Acho is telling Angel Reese. You have to accept this stuff, right? Because you put a target on your back. Well, this came out before she lost a game. This came out after she won the finals last year. This came out after she won the finals last year. So I'm trying to think, was she the villain when they sent these tweets out? Did she say she was the villain? What really happened is they started attacking her. And like I said, you can go read all these comments under, the, under these tweets and see all the attacks. She said she was getting death threats. I believe her. Right? Because I seen some of them in these comments. I, I read some of these comments. It was some nasty people. Right? So, uh, Emmanuel Acho was saying, nah, you deserve this and you should be okay with it and you should wear it. I'm not going to address none of the crazy stuff they were saying. I'm not going to address this LA Times story that came out last week before the uh, UCLA game. 
not go address none of that, but you should be okay with it. You brought this on yourself, right? You can't do this and then do this, right? Now, you got to ask yourself, the two girls at the top that's crying, why did this these tears force Portnoy and Keith Oberman to tweet these out? When they seen those tears at the top, it pricked their hearts. When they seen the tears at the, at the bottom, it forced them to say, you can't cry when you was taunting before. So I don't know who made that rule that if you taunt, that you can't cry. I, who made that rule and who's enforcing it? If you taunt, you can't come back and cry. Who made that rule and who's enforcing it? And why isn't it being enforced across the board? If you taunt, if you showboat, if you got too much passion, you cannot cry. That's what that that's what Emmanuel Acho is telling us. Right? Then he said that when you lose, you have to wear it on the chin. Well, what did she do that didn't suggest that she's wearing it on the chin? Right? She waved bye-bye to her team before she played Iowa. That's her on the top waving bye to her girl that fouled out of the game uh, that she uh, that, uh, that they beat last week. And then this is on the bottom when she fouled out and the Iowa girl is waving her back, giving her the same time. Poetic justice, the same way she did the John Cena, you can't see me to Caitlin Clark. And she said that I gave that to her because she did it two games ago or a game ago. Okay, that's cool. Now, I was doing it to her. Poetic justice. You did it to somebody just like Caitlin did it to somebody a game before, and now I'm doing it back to you. Guess what she did after that? She laughed it off. You got me. Walked to the bench quietly, sat down, and watched the rest of the game. She fouled out. She didn't fuss at the refs. She didn't try to go at the uh, girl that was uh, taunting or waving at her. She just went to the bench, right? And then what did she do after the game? Did she pull out Isaiah Thomas and walk off? No. She came down the line. She hugged Caitlin. She whispered something in her ear. She told us what she said to her at the press conference. She said, go win. This is what she's whispering in her ear, or at least what she said she whispered in her ear. Look at Caitlin smiling. It ain't like she whispering something bad in her ear. Those are real genuine hugs that they're hugging each other with. They don't, they, if they had differences, they put them behind it, it, it looks like. So what is it about Emmanuel Acho seeing this and then prompt him to say that you're not taking the loss on the chin? She took it on the chin. The only thing she did that you say you don't like is cry at the press conference, which is not something that's not normal. This is something that a lot of girls do, especially when they're seniors or juniors that that got you know they got uh, conversations that need to be had. They got decisions that need to be made. Do I come back for one more, one more year? Or do I enter the draft? Right? So she's thinking about, do I enter the draft? She's thinking about, man, all these girls I've been I've been uh, going, going to uh, uh, battle with, either I'm going to leave them or I'm going to come back. And it's hard. I don't know if I'm, I don't know how, I haven't made my mind up. Right? It's a lot of things going through her mind. She just lost a game. She don't think she played her best. Right? Uh, uh, she know what was coming what's coming from the media after this. She know what she's been getting from the media before this. You know, uh, they was already talking about what happened with this LA uh Times uh article. You know, uh that she had to have one of her uh, white teammates, uh Van Leith, Van Leith, uh go and 
uh, speak to the media and and speak on her behalf on how bad this is. The, the the head coach had to talk about this. She talked about it so bad that that's what that's the only thing that made them edit the uh, the article. Like this was all before the game. She got a lot of emotions running through her, and you telling and you telling me that when you seen her cry, the first thing that came to your mind is you can't do that. Someone has to come and explain to me why she can't cry. She didn't fight. She didn't cuss uh, Caitlin Clark out. She didn't talk uh, taunt Clayton. She everything you supposed to do when you lose, she did. Everything you supposed to do when you lose, she did. She shook everyone's hand. She said nice things. She congratulated them. She went to the press. Like like think about the things that people do in defeat that we've seen that we frown upon. We seen Cam Newton lose the Super Bowl and not come to the press conference. That's frowned upon, right? We seen people come to the press conference uh, like LeBron James after they lost in the finals with a whole cast on his hand trying to show, oh, man, I, we lost because I was hurt, right? That was frowned upon. We seen people like Isaiah Thomas not shake everybody's hand and walk out before the time was up on the court. That's frowned upon. We've seen people try to get in people's face and fight. We've seen people come in the pony and, and say the wrong thing. All right? We've seen people arguing with the refs. She could have argued with the ref on that last foul because it wasn't even a charge. They gave it to her anyway. She could have complained about that. She could have came in the podium and complained about the refs. She didn't do none of that. The only thing she did in your eyes that was wrong was cry and, and, and tell people, I'm emotional because it's been a lot going on, you know, uh, death threats, things of that nature. And you telling her that she's not allowed to have the uh, range of emotions go through her. She's not allowed for that. Just think about just just sit back and, and, and think about it. And, and I know Emmanuel Acho is a hot take artist and, you know, he, he got I mean, he 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 he's probably got how many buttons he can push with this take in mind when he put it out there. He's not, he's not on the show actually speaking real thoughts. Most of the time, most of the times this is a hey, look, man, this is, I'm doing this for TV. So I get that part. But the, the crazy thing about it is, is you motivate other people who actually really think like that. And that's, and that's what makes it uh, really cra crazy. I really need to know if I'm off base with this. In the comment section, somebody tell me what is wrong with her crying and why is not wrong for Caitlin Clark to cry. They both cried after they lost. They both taunted it before they lost. They both taunted it during the game. They both did the John Cena. I need to know why there's no huge platforms calling Clayton a POS or calling uh, Caitlyn an effing idiot, or doing hit pieces on her and her team on a huge platform like LA Times. I want to know if the first lady is going to invite the losers of the national championship this year. Like, I need, I need answers on all of that. I need to know what Caitlyn, or not Caitlyn, I need to know what Andrew Reese did wrong. Like, 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 seriously, like, like after the game last night, what did she do wrong by going to the podium and having a range of emotions that's normal for a human being to have? You, this, this excuse that ah, oh, you made yourself the villain, miss me with that. That's tired. That's tired. She didn't make herself a villain, and even if she did, who cares? You telling me it excuses this? It excuses that? It excuses that. You telling me it excuse all that stuff? And it's more. It excuse death threats. Like it really explaining it. Like, tell me how those dots connect. Well, since you tonic Caitlin, all of this stuff is authorized and okay, and you got to accept it. And then you also got to tell me. Why are you so emotionally invested 
Why did it hurt you and prick you so much to see Caitlyn get tonic? Why is she off limits? Those are all questions that need to be answered. But that's all I wanted to uh, say on the matter. I think it's a a, a, a situation that uh, is unfortunate. Um, I don't have a dog in the race. My emotions are not attached to it. Um, but I I do I do observe a lot, and I see a lot of the the um. I, I see a lot of people missing the mark with it, seriously. Like you know, you know, they 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 can't seem to take their mind off of the fact that this is warranted because she uh, she taunted Caitlyn last year. Like no one no one ever forgave her for that. Um, but I just want to know why was you hurt? For, why was you hurt by it? Like why why be hurt that a player got tonic? Why why couldn't it just be oh they competing? I I probably wouldn't have done that. I probably wouldn't advise my daughter to do it, but oh it is what it is. There's <laughs> no easy way to navigate this, right? So I, I I just end it. I end it. So that's uh I mean, that's the show for today, man. Uh I, I don't I don't know how well I, I discussed this at all. Um I yeah, I don't even know if I aired. I I don't know how how well I I discussed this. But um, you know, it's my it's my true thoughts though. It's my true thoughts on how, on, on on as as much as what I can see from it. So I don't know. Y'all let me know what y'all think in the comments. I'll catch y'all on the next episode.